This is Idiot with a Library Card, and I'm continuing, or really starting, my series on the Book of Concord. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Augsburg Confessions. If you want more information of what the Book of Concord is, just listen to the first episode of this series. So let's just jump right in. And I first want to set the scene of what the presentation of the Augsburg Confession looked like. Actually, I'm not going to set the stage with my words. I'm going to instead read from the editor's introduction to the Augsburg Confession from the version of the Book of Concord I'm using for this entire series. That version is Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, the second edition. Quote, On Saturday, June 25th, 1530, at three o'clock in the afternoon, Dr. Christian Bayer stood, walked towards the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, and began reading the Augsburg Confession in a loud and distinct voice. Through the open window, a hushed crowd outside in the courtyard hung on his every word, as did the 200 or so people gathered in the hall. Beside Dr. Bayer stood Dr. Gregory Bruick, holding a copy of the Augsburg Confession in Latin. The German princes around them stood up to indicate their support for the confession. The emperor motioned for them to sit down. When Dr. Bayer finished reading, Dr. Bruick took the German copy of the confession from him, handed both copies to the emperor, and said, Most gracious emperor, this is a confession that will even prevail against the gates of hell with the grace and help of God. Thus, the Augsburg Confession, presented as a unique confession of the truth of God's holy word, distinct from Romanism on the one hand, and Reformed, Anabaptists, and Radicals on the other. June 25th, 1530, is a date every bit as important for Lutherans as the more familiar date of October 31st, 1517, the day on which Luther posted his 95 Theses. So that sort of sets the scene of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession to the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. So if you want more history of the Reformation or Martin Luther's life, there are a ton of books out there. Take your pick. It's an interesting subject, but these documents find us in the middle of it. So this document is about 13 years after the 95 Theses were posted by Martin Luther on the church doors in Wittenberg. So a lot had happened since then. Luther had been called and made his famous Here I Stand speech and had been excommunicated from the church and was now a fugitive in some ways sentenced to death. But he had some friends in high places that were protecting him. This religious division that the Lutherans had created was pulling apart the Holy Roman Empire. And the Catholic emperor, Charles V, probably would have gone to war and crushed his oppositions from the Lutheran princes. But he had problems and enemies more dangerous than the Lutherans in his country. His empire was facing invasion from the Turks, and he needed to bring his empire together to fight these Turks off. So he called for a meeting of the leaders of the states that made up the Holy Roman Empire and representatives from both the Catholic and Lutheran church. At the time it was written... It clears up where the Lutheran Church was different from the other churches, mostly the Catholic Church, but also the newer Christian sects that were popping up, sort of through inspiration from Luther, but not sanctioned by Luther. But what it does also for us readers today is it really clarifies what the Lutheran Church believes. And I would say, and I don't want to speak for other Protestant denominations, what most Christians, especially Protestant Christians, believe. And it does it in such a clear and interesting way. I just, I really love how the arguments are presented and the articles really break down the basics of Christian faith. So the Augsburg Confession starts with a preface, then there are 28 articles, and then a conclusion. So I'm going to break down each of these sections First, better than my rambling, Philip Melanchthon sums up what this meeting is and what this document is going to be. By the way, this document is not written by Martin Luther. Martin Luther is not the author of the Augsburg Confession. 
not all the books in the Book of Concord are written by Martin Luther. Many are, and actually, if, I, if I'm being honest, they are my favorite. I find Martin Luther to be such a sharp, concise, and yet descriptive and bold writer. I love Martin Luther as a writer. He's a great theologian and has very clear ideas. His writing is so sharp and so good. I, I love him as a writer, but this document is not written by him. It's written by a man named Philip Melecton, who was important to the Reformation. He wrote the Augsburg Confession and the Augsburg Apology. So I'm going to read his introduction or part of the introduction to it because it, it sums up everything so well. Philip Melanchthon writes, Most invincible emperor, Caesar Augustus, most clement lord, your imperial majesty has summoned a meeting of the empire here at Augsburg to consider taking action against the Turk, discussing how best to stand effectively against his fury and attacks by means of military force. The Turk is the most atrocious and ancient hereditary enemy of the Christian name and religion. This meeting is also to consider disagreements in our holy religion, the Christian faith, by hearing everyone's opinions and judgments in each other's presence. So I hope that gives you a more clear idea of what this document is and why this meeting was called. But what I personally find more interesting is what the document contains. The Augsburg Confession is broken up into 28 articles. And as much as I'd like to maybe skip a few articles or give you like a high level summary of it, it's really hard because each article covers a specific aspect of the church. And almost all the articles have something profound, thought provoking, I would say soul provoking ideas in them. And so I'm going to go over each article. And I think that's the best way to do it because it's going to paint such a full picture of what Lutherans believe and why this document is so profound to me, and I think it would be profound and interesting to you. Article 1, God. This article really goes over the Trinity and how it works. It also ties the Lutheran Church to the historic Catholic Church in that it brings up earlier heresies and splits in the Church. And a lot of the earlier breaks in the Church have to do with the Holy Trinity and how there is one God in three, I'll use the word forms. The Lutheran Church accepts all three creeds, the Apostle, the Nicene, and the Athenian. Is the Father God greater than the Son Jesus? And we Lutherans, most if not all Christians, would say no, they're the same thing in different forms. But there is also a distinction between them. It can get kind of complicated to think about, but basically the, the God article in this work just talks about the distinction and sameness and how the Holy Trinity works. Article 2, Original Sin. Now, original sin just cuts through all the BS or belief that you could be good enough to be justified before God. You are born a sinner, and the only way you are justified in God's eyes is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. This will come to be a theme throughout the Augsburg Confession and the Book of Concord as a whole. The theme is that you cannot get yourself into heaven. There is no amount of goodness you can do to get yourself into heaven and justify your life in God's eyes. The only path to salvation is through faith in Christ and his death for your sins. There is a lot more of this theme in the Augsburg Confession, but this is a great topic to start with because it shuts down all the talk about an ability to be saved by your own works. You are born with sin and are a sinner from birth, and there is nothing you can do to fix that. The only person that can make it right is Jesus. No matter how much good you do, this is the only way to salvation. Article 3, The Son of God. This article is basically a slight rewording of the Christ part of the Nicene and Apostles' Creed, said in all Lutheran and Catholic churches to this day. Article 4, Justification. This article is short, dense, 
and simple and is a huge aspect of Christianity. So I'm actually just going to read it. Quote, Our church teaches that people cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works. People are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. By his death, Christ made satisfaction for our sins. God counts this faith for righteousness in his sight. And the justification article in the Augsburg Apology, looking ahead, I've read a few places, maybe the most important or one of the most important works by a Christian theologian in history, because it just sums up the Christian religion so perfectly. But it's a bit longer. I won't be able to read it. Um, I, I look forward to giving you a nice summary when we do the Augsburg Apology. Article 5, The Ministry. This article is a little strange for me, and one I struggled with. Its basic message is that you cannot reason or study yourself to faith. The Holy Spirit, which is the form of God that lives in all of us, is given and not earned. It's a short article that has at times kept me up at night, thinking about how hard one should try and be a Christian. It's one of those areas I definitely struggle with, but the basic premise of it is that the Holy Spirit is given, not earned. And I guess what I'd say is why I struggle with it is I'm someone who likes to reason through ideas, and the thing is you can't reason through faith in Christ. And and that's basically the summary of the article, is that you can't reason through it. You have to receive the Holy Spirit with an open heart and let it lead you. Article 6, New Obedience. This article covers what I would say is the flip side of the justification article. If the only thing a person needs to do to be saved is have faith in Christ, then why would they do anything good for anybody else? Why do good works? So this is one of the big breaks between Lutheranism and Catholicism. So in Catholicism, and when I say Catholicism in the rest of this series, I mean the Catholic Church from the time that these documents were written, so the 1500s. So in Catholicism, good works can make up for your sins, and if you have no sins to make up for, good works add up to your score as a good person. The Lutheran take on good works is that you are to do them because this is what you were commanded to do by Christ. That there is no good works counter or even a sin counter. You try not to sin because that is what was commanded of you, and you do good works for the same reason. You cannot truly have faith in Jesus and not try to love and help your fellow man. Article 7, The Church. This is another short article that I'm going to just read, but it does so much. Really, for church services, you had one game in town. There was only one way to do church, and that was the only way to perform a church service. In this article, and this is one of those things the Augsburg Confession does so well, is that it gives the minimum of what a church service should do. Quote, Our churches teach that one holy church is to remain forever. The church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. For the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human traditions that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. As Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. End quote. That's it, and you got a church. You can do the rites and other traditions, and if they, one, elevate those few requirements, or at least don't degrade them, then you are at a fine church. 
and a church passable according to the Lutherans. Article 8. What the Church Is. This one is interesting, and I think will lead into the next article on baptism, but basically it says that if bad people go to your church, or if the pastor of your church is evil, and that's the word used in the article, that does not condemn the church. If an evil pastor baptizes or gives you communion, that does not make those things any less than what they are. Article 9. Baptism. This article is also short and basically says that baptism is the first step on the road to salvation, and for that reason, children should be baptized. There is another level there, and again, it goes to the theme of earning your own salvation. For the radical Anabaptists, which was a sect that sort of popped up after Luther, you didn't baptize children because it's something you should decide. The point is, though, that you don't decide to receive the Holy Spirit. It is given to you, and that is why not only can an infant be baptized, but an infant should be baptized. Article 10, the Lord's Supper. Simply put, the body and blood of Christ is present. Don't know how, don't care how, it's there. Article 11, confession. Private confession is fine and even good, but no one can name all their sins and there is no scoreboard, but it is good to confess the sins you know you have committed. Article 12, Repentance. Now, Article 12 is one of the most important articles in the work, mostly because the question of repentance and indulgences is what started the whole Reformation thing. If you don't know, the Catholic Church started to sell indulgences. Indulgences take your sin, or you can buy them for dead loved ones, who are suffering in purgatory. This is a very complex system of sinning and confessing and then doing certain works or just buying an indulgence. Then there is a question of where indulgences come from and how saints and the Pope have an infinite amount of these things. This is somewhere the Lutherans do a great job of simplifying the church and making it accessible to everyone. How do you repent for your sins? Step one admit it to God, and feel bad about your sin. Step two, have faith that your sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. That's it. That's all there is to it. The other thing this article points out is that this is a religion for everyone, and it's a religion where you are constantly bettering yourself. That is that you are never truly out of the fold once baptized. You never lose the Holy Spirit and you can be contrite about your sins and be forgiven, no matter what. Also, that you are never in nirvana, that you never become the perfect person, or never don't sin. You will always need Christ's forgiveness. Article 13, the use of the sacraments. Basically, the sacraments are important, but mean nothing without faith. Article 14, order of the church. Basically, you need a call to be a pastor. Well-ordered is the term used in this article. You need a procedure to select who can be a pastor and then ordain them. And it should be God-inspired and not used for political gain or to get rid of a wealthy brother that no one likes. No, you should be called by God and there should be a procedure done to be ordained. Article 15, Church Ceremonies. Observing traditions in the church, observing festival days and fast days are good, especially if it focuses your mind on God. That being said, the Catholic Church at the time would say that this is an important part of being saved. For example, not eating meat on Fridays during Lent. Luther would say that if it makes you focus on God and does good for your faithfulness, fine. But these acts do not save you and really don't matter to God. Article 16, Civil Government. This article says you should participate in government and that it's okay to take oaths and you should pay your taxes. It gives you permission to serve in your country's military. The gist of this article is that you should be a good citizen and follow the laws if the laws do not go against God's law. It does also, I think, at least 
encourage you to be involved in your community in a political way. Not only that, but when you are someone who is part of the government, you do your duty in a just and godly way. Article 17, Christ's Return for Judgment. This article goes into the end times in that the church basically believes that Christ will return and the dead will be risen for judgment. I've always had trouble getting my head around the logistics of it. There is a second part, and actually I think this is more important. Quote from the article, Our church also condemns those who are spreading certain Jewish opinions that before the resurrection of the dead, the godly shall take possession of the kingdom of the world, the ungodly being everywhere suppressed. This piggybacks on the last article, It's okay to seek and take civil power, but even if everyone in the government is in the church, you are not to discriminate against people who do not share your beliefs. But throughout this and other documents in this book and Luther's writing altogether, there is a real move against conversion by the sword. Article 18, Free Will. This is an odd one for me. And with the title of free will, you would think it would go over the nature of free will, but it actually focuses on the question of free will in another way. The article states that yes, people have free will to make our own decisions, but when it comes to faith and love for God, that is provided by the Holy Spirit. Now this seems weird. Why would the church basically say that faith is the most important thing, but it is not something you choose to do? To me, it really frees anyone from pride that they are faithful Christians. You do not find Jesus and then will your faith in him. It was given as a gift without your work. And this is a theme generally that you do nothing for your salvation. So cast off pride. This is a timeless lesson for all Christians then and now. Article 19, The Cause of Sin. What's the cause of sin? We are. And the devil. But not God. This is as simple as when people ask why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? These questions, although interesting, are not helpful in a pursuit of God. Sin is not a natural design as some would describe. Article 20. Good works. I would say that this is the most important theme in all of these writings. And it's a through line that goes throughout the whole book of Concord. Good works do not save. They don't even help. There is no scoreboard or tally sheets between sins and good works. You try not to sin because you fear God and you love God and want to walk in his ways, which is an Old Testament phrase that I really love. You do good works for the same reason, because good works are the fruit of a faithful Christian life. Frankly, some of the good works, in air quotes, I don't even know I would consider good works. Take praying the rosary, which is a good thing if it focuses you on Christ and centers you. It does not help anyone else. It's, in my eyes, something you do for yourself. Again, it's a good thing, but not a good work, and does not add to your salvation. At the end of this article is an interesting idea about good works, that good works without faith can lead to actually bad works and bad things. This is kind of another way to say that good intentions pave the road to hell. Good works without a strong foundation in morals and faith can turn into evil works remarkably fast. That doesn't mean that true good works are impossible by non-faithful people, But I think to truly do good in this world, you need a foundation of strong and good principles to do good works, to do truly good works. Article 21, Worship of Saints. This one is pretty simple. Saints should be respected and even venerated, but not worshipped or prayed to. Saints are great examples of how one should live their life in some ways, but one You need to follow your vocation, meaning do what you are good at, and do it well and fairly to make a better world. 
saints are not to be prayed to because why pray to a saint when you can pray to God? Also, saving and worshiping things like saints' bones or even things like pieces of the cross are wrong. Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. And so things of this world really shouldn't be worshipped. Article 22. Both kinds of sacrament. So I thought this one really does not apply anymore, but it for the most part does. At the time this was written, only priests would drink the communion wine. And there is really not a well-known reason why. This changed for the Catholic Church in the 1970s, following something called the Ecumenical Council Vatican II Electric Boogaloo. Okay, not that part. For the most part, only the priests still drink the wine, and no one else does. Now, I would say there is no such thing as half communion. If you just eat the bread, you are communed. This is an important change, as it does three things. I will say that these three things also tend to be things good laws do. Giving everyone the wine for a communion and simplifying who can get communion, one, simplifies the rules. Two, it puts on a more equal footing the pastors and his congregation, and it exposes the stupid and top-heavy bureaucracy of the Catholic Church. Not to say that, sadly, many Lutheran denominations now have very stupid and top-heavy bureaucracies, but that's another show altogether. Actually, I will say, so much of our lives and what governs them are under the immense weight of stupid and top-heavy bureaucracies. So again, good laws and good rules in a church are simple rules that make more of an equal opportunity and cut out or lessen the impact of bad bureaucracy. Article 23, the marriage of priests. Basically, priests should be able to get married. Now, priests do not have to get married, and if you are blessed with the ability to be celibate, all the more to you. And it is a good thing, but to force priests to stay celibate is not good and leads to sexual sins of the priests. Now, there is a lot about this in modern times, but I want to be careful, and a lot of churches have issues with church leaders being sexually immoral. But I think making priests be celibate is not healthy for a church. Past that, a lot of times priests had illegitimate children, and when this rule was put in place, because it didn't start like this, instead of like grandfathering families in, families were broken up, which is certainly against God's will. The other thing, and I think a, a few of the last articles covered this too, pastors are basically regular people who have received a call from God. They need to be virtuous and walk in God's ways, but they're not superior to the butcher or the baker. In a Christian society, those people were called by God to do their vocations. And the pastor does great work. I love so many pastors I've had in my life. But they also need to be fed and clothed. Other people... And faithful people do those jobs, and that's what makes a great community. It's not just a great leader, it's great people within the community. Article 24, The Mass. This article is split into two sections, informally that is. The first part is about the church's service, and what the Lutherans are doing differently from the old church. The thing is that the service was not changed much at all. It really still is very similar. If you go to a Catholic Mass or a Lutheran service, it basically has the same rhythm and order. The changes made at the time, and they are important, is that Luther changed the Latin parts of the service to German. And instead of Latin songs, he replaced them with German songs so that common people could understand. This is one of the things that is an important break and one of the reasons I love this view of Christianity. It acknowledges that ceremony is important, and the traditions are worth preserving. That being said, 
the church service is also there to do so many other things, to comfort, to teach, and to praise God. The act of performing the service is not important without inspiring and moving a congregation. The second part talks a lot about private mass. This was basically when wealthy people would have their own church service performed for them, and they would receive communion for a fee. McClatchen cites a few Bible verses on why this is wrong. Basically, communion is to be offered for free and given in regular intervals. Also, if you are a believer and not actively sinning, you are to be welcome to the Lord's table. This article is very important, and I think opens up that services are to render service to the parishioners, first and foremost, and are not just little shows to be put on each week. The communion is something to be done for the forgiveness of sins. And lastly, when you go to a church, you cease being a master or a slave, a king or a pauper, but are God's children. And this still holds in well-ordered and well-run churches to this day. Article 25, Confession. Confession is a good human institution, but it is just that, a human institution. You don't need to list all the sins you've ever committed, and you don't need to ask for forgiveness or do however many Hail Marys for forgiveness. This can all be done by prayer and faith. Article 26. The Distinction of Meats. This article is all about fasting days and days on the church calendar that you are not to eat certain foods on certain days. The beginning of the article is why telling people to fast on certain days and other such human traditions can get in the way of faith and the life with Christ. The end of the article is about how things like fasting and discipline in your eating and drinking is a good thing. It is a good thing when you decide to do it for yourself. It's godly to not overeat or drink and keep in shape. It does not merit the forgiveness of sins, and you are not to make a show of it. Article 27, Masonic Vows. So this article splits between the problems of the monasteries then and more of an advice for today. First, the issues with then, mostly two, marriage and the use of monasteries as pseudo-prisons. Luther covers the marriage issue when it comes to priests. Basically, it's bad to force people to be celibate, and marriage and sex between husband and wife are gifts from God. Only a few are blessed with the ability to be single. The other part of it is that monasteries were used as places to put wayward boys and girls, forcing them into unbreakable vows of a lonely single life locked up in a monastery. These kids were forced into this life at as young as 15. The other issue, and maybe a more universal issue, is the monk being held up as a superior being and as the life in a monastery as a godly life personified. This is more of a, it doesn't matter what vows you take or that you pray for eight hours a day. Faith in Christ is the only way to salvation. Not only that, there is in this article kind of, you can read it between the lines, that we all have a calling. And this calling is a good thing to pursue. Not only can you do a a regular job or a calling not related to the church and still be a faithful Christian, it's that you can share God's love through your calling instead of trying to force yourself into a godly vocation. Article 28, Church Authority. This article really emphasizes the separation of church and state. The bishops at the time were too focused on political power when they really should have been focused on the power of the gospel. This is something Luther and Lutherism doesn't get enough credit for, and that may be partly to do with the fact that they opened the door to a secularism that the church is not a fan of. I have always felt that the Protestant movement and more specifically, the Lutheran Church, 
was a big factor in the upcoming Enlightenment movement. The Lutheran Church opened the door and pushed the church out of places it didn't belong. But it also moved it to places where it was a better comfort to people. This is a broader point I will make in a minute, but the church, and more to the point, the human elements of the church, have borders that they should stick to, both for the good of society and for the good of the church. The Augsburg Confession sets the stage for the Lutheran church and what it's going to be about, what it is going to value, and what it is going to be able to move on from. The three most important things it does, to me at least— is one, simplifies Christianity so that more people are able to fully participate in it. Second, it gets rid of these earthly and arbitrary rules that make things worse at every level. And lastly, it puts the church in its place in society, which makes it something that you should live every day, from how you organize your home to how you do your work and interact with your neighbors. It frees up things like government and science from the overreaching of bishops and the other church bureaucracy. And on the flip side, it frees up churches to do the good and godly work that these institutions are meant to do. There is so much to get out of this document. It's a revolutionary work that I think does not get enough notice. So if you're listening to this and you've gotten this far in the podcast— and just wanted a summary of the document, I hope I was able to provide it. If you are a Lutheran or a Christian in general, I'd recommend actually reading the Augsburg Confession. It always stirs up the Holy Spirit within me, and I think it can do the same for you. With that, thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment wherever you get your podcasts. The next show in this series will be the Augsburg Apology. The Augsburg Apology basically covers the same topics— but it's an answer to Catholic responses to all the articles I summarized for you. And I always find it cool how a debate can sharpen and clarify beliefs and arguments. And that's something that's neat about the Augsburg Apology, that it's a response to criticisms of all the articles I just summarized for you, the whole Augsburg Confession. It's Basically, the Catholic Church went article to article and wrote criticisms on most of the articles, not all of them, because some of them are are simply so Christian that they obviously agree. It's such a YouTube generation thing where it's a response video to a response video. This is a response document to a response document. But it's really interesting. It's got some great articles in it. The cool thing is, is this is an academic revolution. This is a revolution done on paper. And it sadly will result into a revolution and a a battle with swords and guns. But what I'm covering in the in this Reformation is the revolution that's done on paper, the revolution that's debated on. And th- this is close to me because this is a lot of like what America is. The United States was a revolution, again, done with guns and swords, but it was also a revolution on paper. And we could say this is kind of like the Declaration of Independence for the Lutheran Church. There's a response from the Catholics and then a response from the Lutherans. That's the Augsburg Apology, and that's what I'll be covering next. And the articles in it are basically the same articles in the same order with sharper and more detailed arguments. And that's what's cool about it is that because this is an academic argument— and there's a response and a debate, it doesn't dissolve into name-calling or into worse personal attacks. What it does is it sharpens the Lutherans' beliefs and makes them clearer. And it makes the apology just such a great read. So I will be covering that next time. I look forward to doing it. And I'm not sure if I'm going to slide in a different show, but I'll I'll let you know. Slide in something else I'm reading, uh, because I'm reading some other things that are pretty interesting. But There's definitely an Augsburg Apology show coming, so look out for that.